everyone, this is Kalimara here, and no, it's not Calamari. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. Today, I'm dipping my toes back into Winx Club. I'm really sorry it took so long for me to come back into it, but between finishing up my Miraculous Ladybug series and starting up Wild Word, I've been pretty busy. But hopefully, I have more time now to work on this series as well as my Monster High one. In case you missed it, I made a video about Bloom a while ago where I give my general thoughts and opinions about Wings Club, as well as recapping the series' history and multiple reboots. To sum it up, Wings Club was a huge part of my childhood that ended up heavily influencing my art as an adult, as you can probably tell. I have a lot of nostalgia for the series and I genuinely think the designs, at least from the original run of season 1 through 3, still hold up today. If you're watching this video, you probably know all about Wings Club, but if you don't, Wings Club is an Italian magical girl show that aired in the early 2000s where the main protagonists were fairies. Every fairy has a unique power and they all go to a magic fairy school called Althea in order to learn to use their powers and become full fairies. It's basically Hogwarts, but with fairies. If you guys enjoy magical girl shows and haven't seen Wings Club yet, I highly recommend checking out its original three season run from Rainbow Studios and the movie Secret of the Lost Kingdom, which I consider its canon ending. Technically, season 4 is still a direct continuation of the story with the girls finding the last Earth Fairy and bringing magic back to Earth, but I personally didn't enjoy it as much. And everything after season 4 are just reboots and remakes which were catered to a much younger audience and foregoes a lot of the established character death and development, so I would personally recommend skipping them if you're not into that. But yeah, if you want a more in-depth explanation about Wings Club and its tumultuous history, go check out my first Wings Club video because it provides a lot of context for this video. But right now, we are going to focus on Princess Stella, fairy of the sun and moon, and how she would look in my original fairy form, Calumarix. Cringy, I know, but I haven't come up with a better name yet. I think something that her original design doesn't capture very well is the moon aspect of her being the fairy of the sun and moon. They predominantly focus on her sun aesthetic, but I wanted to avoid that here. I tried to stay true to Stella's facial features as best as I could. I remember back in the day when the series first aired on Nickelodeon, they liked to do these art tutorial segments where show artists from different shows would teach you how to draw certain characters. I wanted Stella's wings to look like a burst of light, because if there's one common thread between the sun, moon, and stars, or that they are all celestial bodies and emit light. Although technically the sun is a star, we're not gonna nitpick that. So I styled Stella's wings to look like a ray of light bursting out of a central celestial body that will form the base of her wings. I decided to do an eclipse because it can be interpreted as either a lunar or solar eclipse, which either way still fits her theme. For some extra flair, I also decided to add light flares later on when I'm detailing her wings. And of course, I added gems dangling from the tips of her wings to make her look extra delicate and extravagant as well as to match Bloom's wings. I don't remember much of this segment and I couldn't find it online anywhere, so maybe I completely made this up in my head, but I distinctly remember the artist talking about how the girls all had different eye shapes and that Stella's eyes were shoe-shaped. Yeah, that's right. Shoe-shaped. I'm not sure what he meant, but I was 6 when I saw it, and it made sense at the time. Though, looking back on the show now, you can really see that the characters had a pretty bad case of same face syndrome, where all the characters looked pretty much identical aside from their eye, hair, and skin color. The only characters who actually had unique eye shapes were Flora and Musa, but everyone else pretty much looked the same. Of course, this only gets infinitely worse in the newer seasons when they switched art styles to appeal more to young kids. 
The characters completely lost any semblance of their individuality and uniqueness and genuinely looked like copy-pasted versions of each other. They even lightened up Aisha and Flora's skin tones to match the others more closely, which I think is completely stupid. But that's only one of a whole dictionary of problems the newer seasons have. And that's not even getting to the live-action Netflix adaptation, which I'm not touching with a 10-foot pole because there's no way I'm getting through that without completely ruining my entire week. But I wanted to emulate the Wings Club art style, even if it is same face syndrome. Because the goal of this video is to create a new fairy form, not redesign an existing one. But maybe that's something I can do in the future. The inspiration I used with Bloom were Greek nymphs, so I'm going to follow that theme with Stella. I'm incorporating long flowing fabrics and adding accessories stylized to look like bursts of light, which will hopefully be congruent with her wings. The shape of the accessories was inspired by art deco design, particularly how they fashion beams of light in posters. I think it's so simple yet so extravagant, which I think suits Stella perfectly. The cut of her dress, particularly the top, was inspired by the top she wore in her season 1 outfit. This style of cut appears a lot among Stella's many outfits and fairy forms, so I kind of see it as her signature look. Though I think the most important piece of accessory for Stella is definitely her crown, especially in this design. Because of the Greek nymph inspo, I wanted to give each of the girls something similar to a laurel wreath to wear in their hair. For Bloom, the wreath was heart-shaped because hearts were her primary motif, so the easy answer for Stella was to do stars, right? But because I wanted to incorporate more of her moon motif into this design, I decided to do moon phases, which ended up working perfectly as a crown. And every queen needs her crown. For her hair, I had debated on giving her those iconic high pigtails as an homage to her canon fairy forms, but I feel like the pigtails are more iconic for Musa, even though I do love the half bun she rocks in her Butterflix and Blue Mix. Full disclosure, as bad as the later seasons are, Musa looked her best with Blue Mix. But for Stella, I settled on a regal half updo with the rest of her hair flowing free. Stella has long straight hair, so she doesn't tend to have a lot of volume, but I think that's what makes her look unique, so I kept her hair in a sleek flowing shape for this design. Overall, I think she looks noble and queenly, which is exactly what I was going for. The pen I'm using for the line art is the Everything Brush by IUPS, which you can download from their Kofi for Clip Studio, Paint, or Procreate. Ayubes is such an amazing artist and a huge source of inspiration for me at the moment, so please go check them out. As you guys know, I've been trying to change up the way I do line art and using a new tool really helped. I'm trying to rely less on the undo button and own my mistakes as opposed to undoing and trying over and over again to get things perfect. I find that it adds more personality to the lines, as well as putting you in the right headspace to go back over and do more interesting things with it. I really want my lines to be as much a part of the art as the rendering is, as opposed to simple boundaries to fill with color. I'm still trying to shake off that mentality, but I think drawing frequently really helped with that. Is there a bad habit you're trying to lose when drawing? Let me know in the comments below. But before we go into the rest of the video, I'd like to thank Sakurako and Tokyo Treat for sponsoring this video! Tokyo Treat and Sakurako are monthly Japanese subscription boxes that give you a taste of Japan's culture. With Tokyo Treat boxes, you will get up to 20 of the latest, most exclusive, limited edition, and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks that are only available in Japan for a limited time, like Sakura Pepsi, Japanese Sake Kit Kats, Ramen, and many more. Meanwhile, Sakurako offers authentic traditional Japanese snacks that support local Japanese snack makers. Each box comes with 20 traditional, authentic, and artisan Japanese snacks, including Japanese teas and a special Japanese tableware. Both are delivered straight from Japan to your door. Tokyo Treat and Sakurako's boxes come with a different theme every month, keeping things fresh and exciting. Right now, spring is in the air. It means that Sakura season is here. 
This month, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako bring the beauty of Sakura season right to your doorstep so you can have your own hanami picnic with their special Sakura-themed snack box. This box is not only packed with delightful Sakura-themed treats, but it also features a stunning Sakura box design. The theme for the Tokyo Treat box is Sakura Picnic Party, and the theme for the Sakurako box is Arrival of Sakura. Don't miss out on this opportunity to experience the Sakura season in a fun and delicious way. You guys know I'm all about pink and cute things, so it really feels as if these boxes were custom made for me. Sakurako and Tokyo Treat want to share Japanese culture to the world through the medium of snacking, and as someone who loves snacks, I fully endorse this. If you want to enjoy pop Japanese snacks, you can choose Tokyo Treat, but if you want traditional Japanese treats, you can enjoy Sakurako instead. It's surprisingly savory, but it's so fragrant. I've never tasted anything like this. Now, if you're hesitant to try foods you aren't familiar with or you can't read the labels on the packaging, the boxes also come with a booklet that explains every snack included in the box, including any allergen information. You can also learn a lot about Japanese culture. This is a company that I have genuinely dreamed of working with because I've loved them for a long time, I love Japanese snacks, and I desperately want to visit Japan again someday. So it's awesome to have a small taste of it from the comfort of my own home. This is something I would have paid for myself even if they hadn't sponsored my video. Thank you so much to Sakurako and Tokyo Treat for sponsoring this video and sending me their amazing snack boxes. I couldn't be more excited and honored to be able to be sponsored by you guys. I love snacks and I really want to visit Japan again. So this was kind of getting really close to my dream. So if you guys also want to try some of these snacks and are interested in getting a taste of Japan, you can use the links in my description or use code Kalimara to get $5 off your first purchase. Thank you again to Sakurako and Tokyo Tree, and on with the video! As previously mentioned, Stella is the fairy of the sun and moon, princess, and guardian fairy of Solaria. Being the only child of King Radius and Queen Luna, she is the sole heiress to the Solarian royal throne. On top of that, she is also the best friend of Bloom and one of the founding members of the titular Wings Club. Like the other members of the Wings Club, she was also a teacher in Althea for a short while. Upon first impressions, Stella fits perfectly into the spoiled, vain, self-centered rich girl trope which is normally used for the bully or villain character. Like Chloe Bourgeois from Miraculous Ladybug or Mandy from Totally Spies. But Wings Club was actually pretty progressive for making Stella one of the main protagonists despite this trope, expanding her character past it. I like to think of her as the precursor to Rarity from My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, which would come out 6 years later in 2010. Although Stella could have easily used her privilege and influence for her own gain, she instead tries to succeed through her own efforts and grow as a person outside of her lineage. Although she can be selfish and immature, she becomes something of a big sister to her friends, being very protective and supportive of them, as well as seeing herself as responsible for them. This does mean that she can be bossy, but I personally think it's a flaw that adds to her character rather than take away from it. Honestly, I see Stella as Chloe Bourgeois done right. She starts off very self-centered and a bit misguided, trying to impose her will on others because that's how things have always worked for her, coming from high status. But eventually, she learns how to treat people and the series actively shows her growing as a person. And it makes sense with the way she was set up from the start. It doesn't feel like it comes out of left field because you do see glimpses that she is a good person deep down. And the best part is, they never regress her into what she was originally. <coughs> Chloe. Yes, Stella acts selfish, but she also shows that she can and is selfless on the inside. 
From the first episode, she tells us that the reason she attended Alfia was to find a way to help her mother and father get along. And after we learn that her parents are divorced and not on speaking terms, it makes sense why she would want that. Stella acts self-centered, but when it comes down to it, she's always thinking of others before herself. So in a way, that prideful, selfish, vain personality was just a front for a troubled girl that doesn't want others to see that she is troubled. A bravado, if you will. One of my most memorable storylines from Wings Club was the one where Stella was cursed into a monster, and the way she could turn back into her original form was to realize that who she was on the inside mattered more than what she looked like on the outside. But then you add the extra layer that Brandon, Stella's boyfriend, was the one who had to help her realize that she was more than just her looks. And I think it's really sad that up until that point, Stella thought the only thing she had to offer was her looks. It just goes to show how complex and multifaceted Stella's character is despite the impression she gives off. I also want to put forth a theory that this is the moon side of Stella's character. See, the way Stella's character is written correlates really closely to the sun and moon cards in Tarot. The sun card in Tarot represents good fortune, happiness, joy, and harmony, which correlates perfectly with her tendency to provide warmth, light, and support to those around her. Meanwhile, the moon card is a card of illusion and deception, and therefore often suggests a time when something is not as it appears to be, perhaps a misunderstanding on your part or a truth you cannot admit to yourself, which, once again, falls perfectly in line with the major conflict she overcomes in the Monstella arc. Arguably her most major character development arc. So although Stella is more well known as the embodiment of the sun, even having the alternative title of Fairy of the Shining Sun, the moon aspect of her character is also in there, hidden behind the light of the sun. Honestly, there really isn't anything I'd change about her story or how she's written. I think she's perfect the way she is. So, naturally, I needed to give her a design that would do her justice. As with my Bloom redesign, the goal for this fairy form was to make them look like ethereal goddesses. Basically, this fairy form is a legendary power that only certain fairies can obtain. These fairies are those who have attained their full fairy form and has earned a mark of valor from each realm in the magic dimension. This mark of valor is a unique tattoo that magically appears and disappears on their skin at whim and can only be attained by becoming a legend among the realm's inhabitants through a service that will be remembered for the rest of time. Once they have collected these marks, the fairy can then ascend to Kalimarik's working title, which grants her the ability to create her own pocket dimension in which she has full control over the space inside. Because of the gravity of this power, I think it's only right that the dress and wings portray its majesty and importance. It's especially important that Stella look majestic, because after all, she is the future queen of Solaria, though as I imagine it takes the girls well into their adulthood to achieve this form, perhaps Stella is already queen. So yeah, lots of pressure. When I get to the colors, I knew I wanted to make slight alterations to Stella's appearance. I made her skin slightly darker and her hair a paler shade of blonde. Naturally, being the fairy of the sun, she would have at least a bit of a tan and because she's the fairy of the moon, I wanted her hair to be as pale as moonlight. Like Bloom, Stella also has signature colors that are present in all her fairy forms. From what I've gathered, those colors are orange, blue, and pink. Though pink is the tying color for all the girls. Orange and blue, in my opinion, are a great way to represent her theme as a sun and moon fairy, but if I had to pick between those three, orange is definitely the primary color used for Stella's designs. So naturally, I had to incorporate that in my design, though I had to adjust the shades around to make her look less like a spray tanned southern housewife or alternatively, Donald Trump. It was a dangerous line I was treading. 
I played around with the color placements until I had a composition I liked, and then I moved on to rendering. As you'll see later on, while shading her wings, I played with the gradients to make them look like the sky as the sun sets or rises. This ends up looking like her wings in her mythics form, which as lackluster and lazy as I think mythics is for how epic the name and implication is, Stella's wings ate. Those colors? Chef's kiss. So while I shade, let's talk about the powers and domains Stella gets with this fairy form. To clarify in case you haven't watched my bloom video, this pocket dimension allows the fairy to manifest anything she wishes, change the terrain and landscape to her desire, slow or speed up the flow of time, store items, and trap creatures inside of it. However, they cannot take something out of the pocket dimension that they manifested inside of it and only people they have granted permission can enter. This is inspired by the Crystal Gems rooms in Steven Universe and based off the concept of Fairyland, which is essentially the pre-Christian land of the dead, where people transported to Fairyland cannot return if they eat or drink there. Here, the fairies are at their most powerful as the pocket dimension amplifies their powers. I imagine her domain to be in the void of space, full of countless stars and moons emitting light from every direction. Her unique power from this form is Celestial Truth, which allows Stella to emit a light that instantly reveals any person or object under concealment, be it hidden passages, treasure, or even other people's intentions. This spell instantly breaks all concealment magic or obstacles intended to conceal, and it may compel others to speak the truth unconditionally. I think it suits Stella's story of finding herself and realizing that she is more than what she believes herself to be. It's also an homage to her story of being able to see through people who have hidden intentions and wanting to bring the truth to light despite finding hardship when she tried to do so. In my last video, I suggested two possible rewrites about Bloom's powers that may drastically change the course of the story. The first was to make it so that because the dragon flame is so old, it's considered archaic and is outclassed by newer branches of magic in their specialty areas. It's also harder to learn because there isn't as many texts to learn from, but is most effective against ancient enemies and magic. It scales down the overpoweredness of the dragon flame and gives Bloom a better character development arc while keeping her balanced with everyone else. The second option is that the great dragon left behind several sparks of its power while creating the magic dimension, and those several other sparks are what the other members of the Wings Club wield. So instead of scaling the dragon flame down, I scale the other character's powers up. This would give equal focus and importance among all the girls. I got equal amounts of people saying they liked one over the other, but after looking back on it now, I think I prefer the first idea of scaling down the dragon's flame specifically and scaling up the other branches of magic in their respective specialties. So what is the specialty for Stella Sun and Moon magic? I think it would be divination, specifically because of astrology, which is a type of divination that tries to predict the future through the observation and interpretation of the fixed stars, the sun, the moon, and the planets. Astrology is often used to guesstimate compatibility with a potential partner as well, which suits Stella's tendency to matchmake her friends. But that's just my two cents. Let me know what you think her specialty should be. But anyway, that's it for me. If you made it this far, please let me know what you thought of my take on Stella. Thank you so much for hanging out with me in the pond for a while. I hope your skin didn't get too pruney. Big shout out to my lovely pond dwellers on Patreon. If you want to become a pond dweller and get early access to my content, join my Patreon. If you want to see more from me, then please follow me on all my social media. If you want to submit fan art or chat with me, join my Discord server. And if you want more of my stories, check out my Wild Word series here on YouTube because that will make me really happy. All the links are in my description and I will see you all in the next video. Goodbye!